I was a percussionist. <laughs> Very amateurish percussionist. But yeah, so you could take aggression out on that. And making noise was just seen, seemed to be a way of like letting go of all the pressures of things. All of a sudden, you know, one minute you can't do anything, next minute you can play a gym. Got me involved, got me off the streets and got me doing things rather than, yeah, not doing things and being a mischief. Very quickly, I gravitated towards the music department um, because it was a safe place to be. Ian was somebody who Alan really sort of um, captured um, because he became very heavily involved in the orchestra. We spent a lot of time together and obviously did concerts and, you know, it, it was that was really, really made up for what else was going on at school. Otherwise, I don't honestly know how I would have got through, to be honest. Caroline was different and we got on really well. I come up from a working class background and uh, Caroline seemed to be in the middle of the road, <laughs> middle class. Uh, she was very polite, very yeah, nice girl. We used to have a really good laugh when we were all together. Alan Renshaw was always on the lookout for ways to broaden the children's musical horizon. I was approached by the, um, the manager or the sound recordist. They were looking for students to come and sing on this new album called Another Brick in the Wall. And I thought, wow, what an opportunity. Pink Floyd, and it's just round the corner. I seem to remember I was told on the day I was hanging around at the right place at the right time and someone said, oh, do you want to go and do it? And I said, yes. There wasn't too many of us. There was, I think, about between 13 and 15 of us or something like that. I can't remember. I don't think anyone has a 100% idea who was in it. And then just went, right, you, 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 come here. That's it, and off we go. You know, and that was it. I don't think there's any list. I don't think... Um, I mean, he chose the people he, uh, he presumed would do the job. So before you went, did you tell Margaret Maiden that the kids were about to be in a song? Uh, no. I mentioned it to one of the deputies, to, if I could take them around. I eventually, uh, when they asked us to sing on the song, I said yes. Uh, and when I saw what the lyrics were, of course, I went, oops! And I had to go and talk to Margaret about it. By that time, of course, um, it was a bit too late to back down. I didn't know that it was happening, this song recording. But at the end of the day, I think it's probably about five o'clock, Alan sidled into my office and said, I think there's something you ought to know. And so I thought, well, what is it now? This was not the first experience I'd had of Alan having to fess up. And um, he said, well, you like all this sort of industry education links business, don't you? And I sort of muttered, mm, tell me more. So he gave me the story that in order to make use of the modern professional recording facilities just near the school, the children had gone out just at the lunchtime, which also wasn't true. They missed half of the afternoon as well, um, and uh, joined in a professional recording. And I said, well, that's all right. And he said, well, you may not like the words that they sang. I said, what do you mean? I thought they were great, absolutely great. But then who wouldn't at that age? I thought, I th yeah, I thought they were good. And I, I was sure, I think we were all pretty sure then that that was going to be a hit song. I didn't really relate to the, to the words in the song. But then, you know, it was probably around about punk had been and, you know, there was sort of anarchy was in the air. And so it was nice to sort of question authority, but you didn't necessarily mean, you know, we don't want any education. You just, you know, it's just a nice sort of anarchic statement in a way. The children were aged between 11 and 15 and had no idea of the trouble their recording would cause. The media were onto it very quickly. It became a sort of cause celebre, and, um, and it just felt as though the whole world had crashed in on us, or on me particularly. 
because it was taken very seriously that this was in some way the school anthem, which was not the case. I remember being very cross that we weren't allowed to make the video and we were told that it was because we didn't have equity cards. Um, but I actually found out subsequently that it was because of all the fuss that had been made that Miss Maiden put her foot down and said that we couldn't do it. Stage school kids had to mime the song for the video as Margaret Maiden warned her pupils against talking to the growing press pack. Really, the depth uh, of criticism of me as a head and this as a school of Islington Green being rubbish, basically. I mean, that was really very, very hard to take because we had by then built up the school into something, you know, reasonably decent. I wouldn't say it was brilliant, but it was, it was, it was good and it was getting better. I think, looking back on it, that the media were picking up on emerging fears about schools being uncontrolled places um, where serious learning was in some way being dropped, and comps in particular. In the end, we got tickets to the concert, we got an album and we got a single, and that was it. I did develop some element of coolness towards the end of my school career, so that I think that was part of it, that I'd been involved in this. And I was blown away by the concert. I was absolutely sat there and like, wow. And, you know, you get shivers up and down your spine. And that was the first time that I'd really experienced that. And, you know, you just wanted more of that, really. So, you know. Well, I got very much into <laughs> going out and partying. I experimented with drugs and alcohol. I went bonkers at 16. I went completely uh, off the rails and, and rebelled against everything. I stopped, stopped going to school. I was so freaked out um, by my whole upbringing that I just, you know, it all went by the wayside. For some of the others involved in the record, school was also coming to a difficult end. My last two years school reports and there's a big difference between the fourth year and how things gradually went downhill to the fifth year. And that does reflect in the, the music as well. Alan reports, Ian is a nice person, but incredibly lazy. Very little real work or enthusiasm uh, this last year. I am worried because he is a capable young man. He's still just trying, but uh, to no avail. I never took any mocks, uh, so I wasn't entered into any exam at all. My whole life just got totally, just really worse and, you know, just lost total interest in school altogether and just wanted to be out. Um, I wanted to... It wasn't because of the record, it was just me. I just wanted to be out of the school working um, and just to get away from it all, really. It's a real blur as to what happened in the last year. The only thing I can really remember is, like, just getting a phone call saying, are you going to turn up for these mocks? Saying no. And then the like, next thing I was working and... Yeah, that was it. The school was finished. Shortly afterwards, Alan Renshaw left the school and moved to Australia. And Margaret Maiden moved on to another post. Her time as the progressive head of Islington Green had ended, and education nationwide was to change once again. The school itself is now due to close and be rebuilt as an academy. Alan is back for the first time in over 25 years to reunite with the children he taught and find out what happened to them. Looks like a prison <laughs> or a big factory. These gates were never here when I was here. <laughs>